When I was seven years old, one of my basketball heroes, Los Angeles Lakers center Wilt Chamberlain, was supposed to box against another one of my heroes, the heavyweight world champion Muhammad Ali. Even as a seven-year-old, I sensed that something was wrong. Wilt might have been 60 pounds heavier and had a 14-inch reach advantage, but Ali was Ali. He was the greatest boxer of all time. What I really remember, though, was how both of those guys could brag. I mean, I'd never met anybody who could woof like that. Not until I met Norm Bass. I'm a Venice, California-born, Los Angeles-based sports fan. One that has played, coached, announced, and promoted sports my whole life. My love affair with sports started in my own backyard and has led me to this podcast. Thanks to the support of the Amateur Athletic Union in East Bay, I'm excited to bring you Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. Hello, Sports Storians. Hope everybody's doing okay. Welcome to audio, video, podcast, episode number 37 of Sports Stories with Denny Lennon, part three of our four-part series on the remarkable life of Norm Bass. If you missed parts one or two, you, of course, can watch or listen to it. The link is on our website at sportsstoriespodcast.com. That fight between Ali and Wilt, it never happened, of course. Wilt came to his senses and signed a big contract with the Lakers, while Ali went on to iconic battles against the likes of Frazier, Norton, and Foreman. Norm Bass? Well, he of course knew both Wilt and Ali, as I would find out some 45 years later when I met Norm. Before we go much further, we need to say hello to the producer of the top video podcast in the Sentinel Adobe Corridor, the director of the SSDL5 slate of shows, the 1997 New Mexico State Aggie Sports Association, Frank O. Pappen, Unsung Hero Award winner, my QP for life, Christine Jim Boo. Nice. I didn't even know I got that award. Yep, you did. It was voted upon by the board of directors of the Aggie Sports Association, so it's legit. Good, nice. Good to know. All right, so together with East Bay, we're building an East Bay store. Do you want to know more? Go ahead and email info at sportsstoriespodcast.com and find out more about it. We also want you to join us on social media to share in our best stories uh, and for a chance to win giveaways, Mm -hmm. East Bay gift cards, all sorts of fun stuff. So if you want to find us, you can find us at Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. That's Denny like the restaurant, Lennon like the Beatle. And uh, where else can they find us? Uh, They can always reach me on Twitter. At Sports Stories DL, uh, we try not only on Twitter but on Instagram and Facebook to put out clips from our show. So again, hopefully everybody's following us on social media. And you can always get to everything on the website, sportsstoriespodcast.com. Mm-hmm. There it is. Well, Norm Bass, as you no doubt have learned, can do some woofing or what some might call boasting. Back in the 60s, he heard that this boxer then named Cassius Clay could do some woofing and was coming through Los Angeles or more specifically the St. Elmo area of LA not far from the 10 freeway and La Brea. Cassius was looking to hang out with the infamous Black Pack which is what Norm and his boys called themselves. But the future Muhammad Ali didn't do a whole lot of woofing while playing poker at the Chamberlain apartments with Norm and the Black Pack. Guess the fact that everybody had their guns on the table might have gave him reason to pause. But as I've said before, these stories are much better told by Norm. So let's get to part three of our series. Before we do, I want to again recognize Norm's son, Norman Delaney Bass III, author of the book, Color Him Father, An American Journey of Hope and Redemption. I also want to give a shout out to Brian Cahill, a documentarian that had put in a couple of years to build a documentary some 14 years ago on Norm. Uh, Before that project was set aside, Brian recently was a guest on our Monday YouTube live show and provided some great insight. And of course, thanks go out to Gus, his family, and the staff at the Coffee Company in Westchester, California for allowing us to interview Norm at his favorite restaurant. So now it's time from the Coffee Company in Westchester, California, where Norm's USA Table Tennis Hall of Fame plaque sits proudly above his favorite table. Here is part three of our interview with the one, the only, Norm Bass. 
Please note this interview was recorded on February 27th, 2020. How about, um, uh, I understand, Bob Gibson, Jim Brown, these, these also came through? I know all them guys. And, and th they're also coming through. Now, one of the stories um, I found interesting was about Cassius Clay. Oh, this, yeah. This is, this is before he was Muhammad Ali, and even before he fought Liston, I believe, yep, right? Yep, yep. So how, how did you meet him? What had happened was that it was a lady who used to play poker with us, the only woman that played poker. She could beat all the fellas but me. <laughs> and so I used to tell her, I said, if you want to get better, give me $5, <laughs> and I'll give you some training on Wednesday. <laughs> so I've talked to her. She said, you know what? I know a guy that run his mouth just like you. I said, who is it? And she was talking about him. Had you heard of him? Oh, yeah. Oh, but sure. She did, but she didn't use no name. Okay. And she said, I know this guy, she said, that run his mouth just like you. I said, well, get him in here. Get him in here. So I looked up, and he, she brought him over to the house. He come in the house hollering about he was the greatest. And he got up in the couch and started running up and down the couch. We playing poker when he came in. And when we played poker, we got our guns on the table. <laughs> I got mine. Ah, that, it's like, you know, who doesn't do that when they We play got poker? him sitting on the table. So all of a sudden, we all turn around and put the gun on him. And he got down in the crouch and stayed in the crouch for about an hour. <laughs> scared to death. So you guys are just messing with him. Because you know he won the Olympic gold medal. Well, we know all that. He was, we know he all was that. coming up the ranks, but he hadn't, he hadn't won the title yet. Yeah, so he, that's how I met him. So that's a, that's a, that's a nice introduction. Did he, did how, he, did he come back by? Dude. Huh? Did he come back Oh, by? he come back by a couple, a few times. Yeah? Yeah, he come back. And you guys getting a woofing contest? Well, we, we'd introduce him to women. He was a square, man. He couldn't, he couldn't, <laughs> he didn't know how to talk to women. Uh -huh. He was just a boxer, a big dumb boxer. <laughs> you know, he couldn't play no other sport. Really? Well, you would think a boxer would be pretty agile, pretty sure. uh, athletic. We take him to the basketball court. He's dribbling with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard Muhammad Ali made fun of before. But he didn't have any, 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 any coordination left. Oh, wow. So this is uh, about a year, I guess, before he beats Liston for the title. So he's yeah. got to beat Patterson to get to Liston, I think, or something. Uh, I don't remember. I no, forget. I don't know if he did or not, how yeah. that went. But I know he yeah. whipped Liston wow. in Florida. Yeah, he sure did. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so look at all these people that are, that you're rolling rolling with. Anybody I left out that's uh, that you remember from coming through that time that was an interesting character? Well, uh, uh, Gail Sayers used mm. to come through there. We used to laugh a lot. If he saw me right now, he would run right out the room laughing. <laughs> he would start laughing. And uh, yeah, he's he's from Kansas, right? He played he played football you know, in Kansas. Do you know a guy named H. B. Barnum? The he's a musician. He plays for movies on themes okay. and things like that. He was well known a musician. Sure. Well, he come by there one day looking for Dick, uh -huh. and I well, I was the only one at home, and he came by there and we waited. I said, Dick, probably be, be here pretty soon. He said, You play cards? <laughs> <laughs> You're I said, like, Yeah, mm, I dabble. We play, so he wanted to play a game called Tunk. Okay. And head up, and we playing for ten dollars and twenty dollars if you tunk. Uh huh. I'm beating this guy's brains out. About five or six games in a row, I'm taking all his money. And he's trying to boop, bop, doop, doop, doing all that, trying to trying to do a little music scanning and all that while we playing. <laughs> sure. Next thing I know, he was singing in Spanish. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's how bad I was whooping him. But he, he wanted to pay you off in pesos. But no, I, no, but no he, 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 he was getting beat so bad, he didn't know what to do. And he started singing in Spanish. I said, dang. <laughs> Um, there was um, a, a, a KIIX TV show that was going on in these days. Now, was that like a local television station? Is that why a lot of these um, the athletes would come in and they would go on that show? Do you remember this at all? I, I read somewhere your, your son was writing about it seemed like that was might have been a local like um, broadcasting show, like something like KDOC or something like that. But well, I know that my brother and Bill Russell mm. and a guy named Purvis Atkins was the first – Black dudes that have a sports show on television. Yeah, that's that. They, I think they that's had it. that. They had they. They was on that show. Wow. Uh, in the background was Quincy Quincy Jones mm -hmm. and all that, but the thing folded. But they was the first one to have a show like that. This is a time, um, you know, in the '60s. Obviously, there's there's a lot of uh, racial tension um, in, in this in in this city as well as in the country. And and LAPD has a, you know, 
a terrible reputation. Oh, yeah. Um, but I understand, was there at one point a judge who ordered you guys to, you know, stay within your own boundary or something like that? <laughs> we were barred from house parties. <laughs> From your own house parties? No, from other folks' houses. Okay, there you and go. And the judge said, I don't want you guys attending no house parties. You can have your own. That's why we gave parties every night. Okay. But we couldn't go to nobody else's because we fight. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> See, oh, it was boy. three or four of my buddies was down here that didn't play sports, but they all from Vallejo, and that's all we did in Vallejo was fight. <laughs> and so we get in the fight down. Them guys didn't know that we was treacherous, man. <laughs> That was one of the reasons Dick and my buddy went into the bail bonding business. If somebody jumped bail, you could go get them and beat their butt. It's all right. And they went up on a ship and whooped a sailor one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a turnaround <laughs> on the zoot suit days. So they loved that aspect of it. It wasn't about the money. It was just whooping this guy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, Norm, how is it? Um, tell us, how, how does it end with the Kansas City Athletics? Uh, 63, I think, right? Well, the arm was so bad mm -hmm. that I couldn't even uh, take a shower, man. Mm. The arm would just lock right there. I couldn't throw. And then arthritis was sitting in, and they didn't know what to do with arthritis in 1965, 60, all that. Mm -hmm. And I got a hold to a doctor there, and you know what he was giving me? 16 aspirins a day. Oh Jeez. Gosh. He said, the more you put in your system, the better it is. It burned a hole in my oh. kidney and all that. Couldn't even drink water because Ooh. of that. So I stayed on that for two years. Then I finally I stopped taking that. Then I got into watching what I eat and everything, and I started feeling better. That's how I got into chicken and fish and all that. Okay. I met this guy that had, was doing acupuncture mm. from China, and acupuncture was illegal in the United States when I met this guy. Mm -hmm. But he would meet in people's houses, and he'd call me on the phone, tell me to come over. Hmm. I'd go over there, and he'd stick a couple of needles in me. He'd fix me up. Hmm. Right. That's, he the one who told me about the diet. We interrupt this podcast to bring you a commercial. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon aims to bring its subscribers interesting, unique, and uplifting stories. You can find us at sportsstoriespodcast.com. We drop audio, video podcasts every Thursday and go live at 5 on YouTube four nights a week. That's Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. And now back to our interview. So did the, did the Kansas City Athletics send you... Back to El Paso? Is that how that happened? Well, they, 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 they sent me to El Paso. Now, I pitched one game in that league. Mm -hmm. I win, but I can't, can't even eat. My arm locked. Mm. Couldn't throw. Hmm. And when I couldn't throw, I said, well, maybe I can still play football. <laughs> okay. So that's how I got, that's most how I got pe into Most people in, in the athletic world who get run out of one sport, they don't say, oh, I know. I could go play in the NFL. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what, that's what that. I thought. <laughs> And I and I told Dick, I said, Dick, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out here and try to see if I play football here. So Dick and Ollie Manson and all them guys would take me to the field and run me through exercise. They said the biggest thing that's gonna be a problem. I hadn't played football in seven years. Mm -hmm. Was your neck? Your neck might break because you haven't been hitting nobody or nothing. Mm -hmm. So they ran me through a bunch of drills. They got me ready. They worked me out and all that. Mm -hmm. And the Rams wanted me to come out there for them. So Dick Bass, Ollie Matson. Matson was a USF guy, right? I think he. I think he was a. He was a great player. San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, he was terrific. Yeah. Uh, he was in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Ollie oh. Matson ran in the Olympics. Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, that's right. He, he was super. He, fat. he, he was me he and was, Dick's he was, idol. He, he was, was our he, idol. He was part of that USF Don's team that went undefeated. No, that was Bill Russell. No, no, no. I mean in football. Oh, oh football, yeah. Yeah. Ollie Matson, Did yeah. you know they were supposed to play in the Cotton Bowl? Yeah, and then they wouldn't. And they wouldn't play because he right. was black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the whole team didn't play. Yeah. And that's why they finished nine and zero, and they've held yeah. that throughout. The, they stand tall in the in the it was, annals of time. It was uh, Ali Matson. He was yeah. tough. Wow. So they were running you through drills, getting you ready. And they got me ready, and I didn't really know what kind of condition I would be in in the first place. I hadn't played football in a while, so Denver 
one of the coaches down there used to be at COP. Mm. He heard about I was going to try to play football, and they offered me a couple of grand and some shoes. I said, well, let me go to Denver. So I went to Denver on that. When I got there, they had 90 guys in the camp, 90. 90. And they only kept 34. And, and, and you went, this is in Fort Collins, I think, or something, for training? I mean, you're mile high. We in That's Boulder, gotta... Colorado, Colorado, where okay. the camp was in Boulder, at the college out there. Wow. But That's gotta... not only did I, I hadn't played in six or seven years now, I still had on high top shoes and all that. <laughs> Didn't, never seen a kicking shoe. Oh. Never heard of that. They had invented a kicking shoe. Okay. And I didn't even know whether I could kick no more or nothing. I wasn't even in I was trying to make the team. <laughs> so the first scrimmage they had there, I made the team. The first scrimmage. First scrimmage, you make the team. Make the team. The guy that was all <laughs> league was coming around the corner, and I jacked him up and dropped, stopped him for a loss. And the man said, that's just the guy we're looking for. <laughs> I made the team. And out of 34 guys, I make the starting team. Wow. wow. The first wow. league game was against the Jets. I'm kicking off. Okay. You know how I got the job? You're kicking off in an NFL football game about a, less than a year after you got run out of Major League Baseball. Yeah. <laughs> but what had happened was that uh, I had a sprained ankle one day. And when you have a sprained ankle, they put you on a field. They had two practice fields, football fields. Okay. And I'm over here with the ball boy. And I said, hey, man, you got a tee in there? Kick it. You know, where you put the ball on the tee? Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah. I said, get that out. Let me try something. I put it down, and I limped up to the ball with a sprained angle, and I kicked it and went about 20 yards. I said, baby, I wonder, can I still do this? I was just curious. So I kicked another one, went about 30. And there's scrimmages going on over here. Mm-hmm. So I got back this time, and I rooted one. It went off the field, <laughs> over the goal post, upside the wall. And they stopped the, the scrimmage. <laughs> And the coach said, who in the hell kicked that ball? <laughs> yeah, I'm talking stuff, not me. That's I'm like, the one that did it. You're like Forrest Gump running and through they said, football uh, practice at Alabama. Somebody get him a kicking shoe. I said, give me some tennis shoes, man. <laughs> 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 and I was the kicker. Wow. Okay, so your first game against the Jets. Just the Jets. Yeah? How'd that And go? I kicked off. You kicked off. And all them guys was teasing me about coming to base football, go back to baseball on the sideline and all that. Mm -hmm. But I could handle it. I said, don't let me catch you on the field out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How'd that game go? Oh, we got beat. Yeah. We got beat. Denver didn't have – but on that team, we had some individuals on there that was pretty, almost uh, – a lot of them in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Willie Brown was on that team. Wow. Uh, Ike Lasseter was on that team. Uh, Hewitt Dixon was on that team, the running back. Sure. Did I ever tell you that uh, one of the players that I played with at COP was playing with the Oakland Raiders? His name was Wayne Hawkins. He was Wayne all Hawkins. pro lineman. Mm -hmm. He told Al Davis that I was over there at Denver, and I knew all about the game, and I'm going to hook you up on the phone with him, and anybody you want to know about, he'll tell you. <laughs> so he called on the phone. He put Davis on the phone, and Davis asking me about Hewitt Dixon. Al and, Davis getting deep intel from the guy who oh played yeah. against all these guys. And did you know I told him about Hewitt Dixon? They had him at tight end. Huh. I said, he's a running back. <laughs> he made a trade and got him just on what I told him. Wow. And, they, and they win the Super Bowl, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at you doing this behind the scenes well, work. Well, the, the Wayne Hawkins knew I was pretty smart. I was, a, I was a smart dude. I could figure out something. We had a coach in college. Wait, I thought you, were, you weren't smart enough to play quarterback, though, Norm. Well, well, that was in the freshman. <laughs> but the coach on the team, he judged your smarts by a checker game. Wow. Huh. He played checkers with everybody, and he judged your intellect okay. by a checker huh. game. He don't know that me and my dad played 300 games a day <laughs> of checkers in the 11th and 12th grade. Okay. And so we get on the thing, and I jump all his checkers. I just jumped all of them. <laughs> and he was following me around the campus. He told Dick I was a genius, man. Uh. <laughs> man. Is there anything you can't do, Norm? Uh. And I'm talking all this stuff to him. How did, <coughs> how did it end with uh, Denver? Arthritis got so bad, I couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. I was taking shots from a private doctor, cortisone, so I could even go out on the field. Mm -hmm. Finally, I had to stop. Mm. They didn't even know I had that. Yeah. I'm playing with what I got now. The arms are bent, fingers are bent, and I'm playing football like that. Mm. They didn't even notice it. Wow. I'm hitting them pretty good, man. <laughs> and so you just said, I can't do this. Well, I knew I couldn't do it. I yeah. knew I couldn't pitch no more either before they told me that. 
your um, your son uh, writes in the book um, about being at the crossroads, and that it's like slowly, cruelly, my father was ushered into a world of uncertainty, only with the knowledge that his professional athletic career was suddenly over at the age of 26. It was early June 65 in El Paso. Uh, Texas would see Junior in a professional uniform for the last time. Then he was unceremoniously de disemplained to an empty, desolate place called the Crossroads. Sports world he so desperately yearned to be part of glided across the big stage without him. Your son's a good writer, by the way. I, did, I didn't know what to do at that point. All mm -hmm. I knew was sports. Yeah. And then suddenly that was taken away. Right. Fifteen years I was bitter. Mm. Not at the game, but because I couldn't play no more. I was all pissed off. Mm -hmm. And one day I was taking some kids to the park. And I looked in the window, and there was a guy was playing ping pong, table tennis. Mm -hmm. And he was playing, this guy was about 40, and he was beating the little boy about 12, just beating him, just beating him up. <laughs> and I didn't like that. I went around in there, and I said, man, let me play the winner. And I took the house paddle, and I beat this guy. <laughs> and he said, hey, man, you're pretty good. He said, uh, we play down here on Saturday and at this club, and they said, you need to come down there with us. So I, that's how I started. So that's how you started. Now, that was before that that you were finally diagnosed appropriately with rheumatoid arthritis. Is that correct? Yep. And um, one of the things I found so interesting is, um, so you're diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis of the most, of the most um, severe type, but you, your mind starts racing backwards, and you can remember this time when you were playing pickup basketball with Robert Curlin. Who, right, is that is that his name, or or you were Doctor Curlin? Yeah, and so it says uh, your son writes. Uh, perhaps the most frightening recollection he surprised himself with was when in 1960, yeah, with Doctor Robert Curlin, um, he, he, my father loved to play basketball at Queen Anne Park. So he goes up and to Doctor Curlin, and you showed him your right pinky that you had injured during a recent pickup game of basketball. And Doctor Curlin says, um, I don't know about your finger, Norm. But you have severe rheumatoid arthritis. You have about five years to pitch. Well, he didn't even say that. He said about two, maybe, maybe. Wow. So that's he wild. told me. He told me I was. Uh, that's the best I can get out of that. He was a Rams doctor. And and you at the time went, oh yeah, okay. Like you just kind of you kept moving. Like you you didn't. Well, I believed him because I knew in my heart that I was deteriorating. I knew I that I wasn't going to be able to play that that long. Right. And that was taken away. Right. All that was taken away. So now I'm going through this, this funk here, and I didn't, sure. I didn't even know what I made on the job I was working. I didn't even look at the check. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is supported by the AAU. Find a local event and join at aausports.org. And remember, you can catch your favorite amateur sports live stream, replays, and highlights at ballertv.com. Sports Stories, along with East Bay, supports the Heroes Movement, a nonprofit that bridges the gap from mental or physical therapy to getting strong again through strength and conditioning workouts. This free service is available for any veteran of the United States Armed Forces. Visit HeroesMovementUSA.org for more information. Sports Stories, along with thousands of people across the country, also supports the My Stuff Bags Foundation a nonprofit that provides traumatized children with new belongings and new hope. Learn more at mystuffbags.org. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is a production of Sports Stories, Inc. and is available on Apple Podcasts and YouTube or wherever you listen and watch. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and give us a review. It really helps spread the word. You can find all our social media links, archives, and other info on our website at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Special thanks to the John R. Wooden Course and Wooden's Wisdom. Original music for Sports Stories is courtesy of Lennon Music Productions. Original images by Sienna Lennon Photography. Sports Stories is produced by Christine Jimbo and Marley Rice. Sports Stories is edited by Bob McCall. Additional staff include Ray Castro, Teresa Dolan, Jake Downey, Carlos Haro, and Buck Magic Lennon. I've been running down the road trying to loosen my little got sports stories on my mind. Looking for the look, it might be on Facebook. 
It's not hard to find sports stories with Danny. Come and watch it with me and take it easy. Come and watch on YouTube. It starts at 5 o'clock. If there's any chance to talk, it's with Sports Stories. See you next week. Whoa! Check it out, book!